Hey everyone, welcome back to Kotlin at Lightspeed. In this part, we're going to talk about the collections and the Kotlin standard library. So I'm going to get straight to the point. I'm not going to waste any of your time. So here in the project that we created over the past couple of videos, I'm going to create another application specifically for this part. So here under Comrock the JVM, I'm going to create a new Kotlin application. I'm going to call this collections. Assuming I can spell collections properly, and I'm going to make it an object with a main method. And from the previous video in OOP, we learned what an object was, and this fun main turns this object into a standalone JVM application. So I'm going to focus on collections in this video, and we're going to use main in order for us to test anything. Okay, so what are collections in Kotlin? You probably know from other programming languages, collections are some of the most important things that we need in programming in general because they allow us to store various forms of data in the form of lists, arrays, sets, maps, and various other data structures that are particularly useful to us in various scenarios. I'm going to discuss about these data structures because they are the most popular. So I'm going to start by discussing what a list is. So a list is a data structure that allows the storage of objects of the same type in sequence. So the order matters. So let me discuss what a list is. So I'm going to define a val a list. And the type, the general type for lists in Kotlin is the type list with a capital L. And this is parameterized with a type parameter. Let's say we're going to use a list of integers here. And in order to construct a list, there are various constructors. One of the most popular is list of, where you can put any sort of arguments inside. For example, the numbers one, two, three, four. And these numbers are stored in this list in sequence. Now, there are various implementations of lists, like array lists and linked lists and so on and so forth. The implementation isn't that important because list is an interface. So we have an API that is a set of methods that this list can uh, contain or it can offer. And the list of constructor, depending on the kind of arguments that you pass inside, will give you back a particular implementation of a list. But you don't really care about that because the API is the same. And the main API is to be able to index an element and to be able to tell the size of that list. So for example, if I am interested in accessing the third element, so one, two, and I want to access the third element, let's say third element, this is going to be an int. And the way that we can index things in a list is to say a list.get at the index two. That is because lists are zero indexed. And uh, you probably know from other languages, most arrays and lists in the most programming languages are zero index, meaning that the first element is at index zero second item at index one, third item at index two, which is why I'm uh, calling the get method on the index two. Now, the get method is also an operator in the sense that I can say third element version two. So another way of accessing the third element in this list is going to be a list with square brackets and then two. So this is the same as calling a list.get at index two. We're going to discuss in a separate part how this thing is possible, how indexing is possible, and the kind of operators that you can overload in Kotlin. So these two are equivalent. They, in fact, call the same method called get. Now, the ability to call the size is to say, let's say length as a list dot size. So this is a property of a list. So this is the fundamental capability of a list, to be able to index an element and to tell its size. Now, lists are obviously far richer than that, so I'm going to show you some other API. For example, I'm going to try to find an, uh, the index of a particular element. And this is something that you do in JavaScript a lot, especially if you're doing vanilla JavaScript. Let's say find the number three as a list.index of the number three. And this is going to be the index at which the number three occurs first in the list. So it's going to be two in this case. But if I said index of 99, this is going to be index negative one in the sense that number 99 cannot be found in the list. And by uh, comparing the index of a particular element with zero, you can tell whether this thing exists in the list or not. Obviously, there is a method called contains, so let's say has three as a list dot contains three. And obviously, this is going to return true. And this is far more useful. So I can say a list contains three to be able to tell just by looking at this line whether the item is in the list or not, rather than doing index of and comparing that to zero. There are other methods too. For example, if you want to slice this list in between some indices, you can say sublist as a list dot sublist from index, let's say one and non-inclusive two. So 
the API is from inclusive and to exclusive. So from index one up to and excluding index number two, so a sublist with one and two is just going to give me back the element at index one without uh, getting the element at index two as well. So this is gonna give me back the list with just the item two. Also, there are ways in which you can add items at the end of the list. For example, with five, I can say a list dot plus the number five, and this is gonna be the list one, two, three, four, five. Now, besides these quite useful functions, we have a so-called functional programming API. And we're gonna talk about functional programming and functional collections in a separate part. So functional programming is going to be reserved for later. Okay. Now, these lists, it's important to note that they are, at least in the constructor list of, they are immutable. Meaning that any change to this list, for example, a list plus five, is going to give me back a new list rather than mutating or changing the old one. So this is going to be a new list of integers, separate from the old one to which I added the number five. There are mutable lists as well, so mutable lists. And they share the same API. So I'm going to say val mutable list as instead of list of, there is mutable list of. So I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is a mutable list. And the uh, uh, mutable lists have the ability to change uh, contents in place. For example, I can say in main mutable list at index two is equal to 99. So that is the same as saying mutable list dot set at index two, I'm going to set the item 99. So this is the same expression, rather. So this syntax is actually calling the set method behind the scenes, but this is far more familiar to us, especially if you're coming from a C family of languages like C or Java, this thing is very familiar. Now, mutable lists have their use, but if you want a data structure that can store elements in sequence and also keep them fast and also mutable, why not use arrays? You're probably familiar with arrays, and arrays are very fast in Kotlin because they map to GVM arrays, which also map to operating system arrays. And these are very fast. So I'm gonna show you an array. So an array as array of, I'm going to have, let's say, uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven, or something like that. And this is also mutable in the sense that you can also call set or use this sort of syntax. So if I use array instead of mutable list, you have the same mutation API. And arrays are also generally faster than lists, although lists can also exploit some optimization techniques. So you have the notion of arrays and they have the same sort of syntax that you can expect. Okay. So these are linear collections in which we store the elements in the same order. So the order is predefined. For example, in sets, which have a different property that you cannot contain duplicates, you lose this sort of guarantee in the sense that the order in general cannot be guaranteed. But a set is useful for a different use case, which is that it cannot contain duplicates. Let me show you how you can use a set. So I'm going to say a set and the constructor is very similar to lists and arrays. So you can say set of, and I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And the reason I do that is because these duplicates will not be contained twice. For example, if you print this set, so I'm gonna say print line, print line, a set, you're gonna see the numbers one, two, three, four being printed just once, All right? So we see, the numbers one, two, three, four. Now the order one, two, three, four is just coincidental. You shouldn't rely on the order of the elements in the data structure being the same as the order in which you wrote them in the declaration, okay? Now the main API of a set is to tell whether an item is in the set or not. So the API is contains. So let's say contains one as a set dot contains one. This is the main API of a set to tell whether an item is in the set or not. An equivalent syntax for that, say contains one in a different version or in a different way, is to say one in a set, which is the same expression. So this is what is called a syntax sugar, which the compiler rewrites to the first version. Now, besides the main API to tell whether an item is in the set or not, obviously we have other API or uh, another set of methods to change the set or return new sets. So for example, if you use the set of constructor here, you are going to obtain an immutable set. 
in which you have to construct a new set if you want to make any sort of modifications. For example, if I want to add 7 as a set dot plus item 7, and this is going to be a new set, and that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 7, obviously in potentially a different order depending on the implementation of the set. You can remove an element, for example, without 3 as a set minus 3, and this is going to be a new set, and that's going to be 1, 2, 4. And there is syntax sugar for plus and minus, and we are going to discuss that in a separate part when we are going to talk about operator overloading. Now, as was the case for lists, you also have mutable sets. So, for example, val, let's call this mutable set as mutable set of, and you can write any sort of numbers here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. It has the same API as the original set because it conforms to uh, the set interface. A mutable set is a derived version of that. But you can also mutate it in place. For example, in main, I can say mutable set dot add. And with the add method, I can add the number 99. And I can print it out. So I'm going to say print mutable set, run it. And after the add, we're going to see the number 99 in the set as well. So you can call these methods that may return something, and uh, this thing returns a boolean whether or not the addition was successful, which is equivalent to saying that 99 uh, was not present in the set prior to add and false otherwise. So mutable sets have the same API as regular sets, only that you can also mutate them in place. I'm actually going to leave it here. So this was sets. And finally, I want to talk about maps. Maps are key value associations. You may have encountered the concept of maps in whatever language you may have been writing in. For example, in Java, there is the concept of maps. Uh, in Scala, likewise, we have uh, dictionaries in Python and objects in JavaScript. The concept is very similar. So let me define a phone book which is a classical example of a map. And I'm going to use the construct map of. Now, map of, instead of taking regular items, it takes pairs. So in order to build a pair, let's say pair, with, let's say, Daniel has the phone number 123, and uh, this is a key value association. So Daniel has the number 123. Or if you want to build a pair without this convoluted structure here by instantiating a class, you can say Alice 2 999. So this is the same as having a pair with Alice and 999. Again, this is syntax sugar that the compiler figures out as a pair Alice to 999. This syntax sugar is implemented as what is called an extension method, and we're going to discuss extension methods in a separate part. So a phone book here is composed of two key value associations. The keys must be unique, and that is a classical condition for maps. And the types for maps, uh, or rather the map data type, takes two type arguments, one for the key type and one for the value type. So this is a map from strings to integers. If you print it out, so I'm going to say print line, phone book, you'll see a human readable thing like Daniel equals 123, Alice equals 999, as if Daniel and Alice were properties of a dictionary. So this is uh, very appealing to those of you coming from Python, for example. Now, the fundamental API, so the main API, contains the following methods. First of all, to be able to tell whether an item is in the map, so it contains a key, and the way that you'll test whether a phone book contains a key is to say, for example, has Alice as phone book dot contains Alice. And this is true or false, whether the key Alice is in the map, or you can use the Alice in a map syntax structure. So I'm going to say has Alice version two as Alice in phone book. And that is the same thing. So we can use the same syntax sugar for the contains method. You can get a, a value for a key. So get the value for a key. So let's say I want to take Alice's number. So Alice number as phone book get on the key Alice. So this is going to retrieve the number associated to the key Alice. Or instead of get, you can use the same syntax uh, sugar that we used for lists and arrays. So we can use the 
uh, square bracket indexing, so Alice number version two as phone book on the key Alice, so, or accessing on the Alice key. So there you go, folks, some of the fundamental collections in the Kotlin language. I hope you like this part. Join me for the next one.